Okay, one o'clock. Let's go ahead and get started here. Showing my screen. Thank you for being here, everybody. For those of you who haven't been here before, this is the weekly JV Partner webinar, uh, which what I mean by that is that oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes I have some of the folks I'm working with uh, that are on the call. And today I just see Avish is about to be dialed in here. So we will uh, talk with him. And Avish, what's happening? Hey, Fred, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. Good. Well, thanks for being here. I guess you're the only one... Uh, who uh, who isn't working feverishly? <laughs> I see. That's how it is. <laughs> Other than me. Um, so anyway, what I wanted to do is start tonight by giving an example from a real life. Um, I've got. I'm operating today on about uh, two hours of sleep, uh, only because I started playing poker, which all of some of you may know. I uh, started playing poker last night at about seven o'clock, and uh, got home and got to bed about four twenty-five in the morning. And um, my goodness. Yeah. The example that I wanted to give, though, uh, really is sort of a pretty good business slash life lesson, which is this. What I noticed is, uh, first off, there's a couple of general things um, that I have I have noticed um, about myself. First off, never play when tired, and never play impatient, because it's a game that requires. Uh, a lot of patience. And I think this is true in any kind of business, whether it's information marketing or any other business. I think those two things apply pretty uh, pretty readily to those to the other fields, like anything in information marketing. But more importantly, and I think the most important thing that I learned from last night is always play anything or do anything when you have a competitive advantage. Now, let me explain to you. I am, uh, you know, I have a drink every once in a while, but uh, I'm not a big drinker. And uh, there was a guy at the table last night who was a really good guy. As it turns out, he says, and I trust him, he went to Yale Law School, and he's on track to become a, uh, a, a federal judge. But uh, he, he can't do any other controlled substances because that would make him ineligible if caught to become a judge. But there is nothing wrong in these United States with someone being, and I, I don't mean to say this about him, with being a drunk. Um, that's okay. So what happened was when I met him, he was only on his second uh, Corona and second Jägermeister bomb. Jäger bomb. Uh, <laughs> and for those of you who aren't familiar, Avish, why don't you sort of impart the wisdom of, uh, a wisdom of what a Jäger bomb is, since I'm, a, I'm less of a drinker. But not to say you're a, you're a lush, but tell people. You know, I'm not exactly sure what a Jaeger bomb is. I know what a car bomb is. I'm okay. assuming it's similar. Okay, so here's what a Jaeger bomb is. Apparently, it's Jaegermeister with some kind of energy drink mixed together. Oh. So you're both right. getting an alcoholic impairment as well as getting a buzz. So like you're getting <laughs> like a, 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 a speedy kind of thing happening along with getting progressively more drunk. Well, what happened was that this guy is, when he's not drunk, a pretty damn good poker player. And he accumulated, you know, maybe seven, $800 worth of chips. And some of them were from me, but not many of them because I was sort of careful to stay out of his way. But what happened was, as he got to his fourth and fifth, maybe even sixth Jägerbomb and sixth uh, Corona, he started playing really, really sloppy, and he eventually lost all his chips. Unfortunately, not to me. Um, because, I mean, given that I was being nice to him, if he was going to lose it to anyone, I think he really should have given it to me. Um, but the, but the <laughs> yeah. point, but the point is that here's the deal. You can find out and you know when people are playing at the tables that they tend to be drunker. And that's usually between about 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. in the morning. And so therefore, I mean, it makes sense if you're trying to play poker and make money to try and skew your play, to play during the times when people are uh, impaired. And I think the same thing is true in information marketing. So to bring this around full circle, what I think is that I don't think we should be looking to compete in markets where you know we don't have some kind of a competitive advantage. Or if we don't have a competitive advantage in the market, then we have to manufacture one. And I think that Avish, uh, speakingexpert.com would be a good example. So 
you know, the topic of speaking, or let's just say, let's make it public speaking, since professional speaking is a little bit more narrow. So public speaking, Avisha's topic, right? So if you've got public speaking as sort of your general topic, I think you and I would both agree that, Avish, there is a lot of competition, correct? Yep. Okay, so then the question is, in order to gain t uh, uh, maintain or gain a competitive advantage, how do you do that with a topic like public speaking that is more general? And rather than just asking and answering the questions, I know that Avish is, you know, he's... I went to a state school. He went to an Ivy League school. So I can ask him, I can ask him these questions knowing that I'll get the correct answer. So, uh, Avish, what would we then have to do with public speaking or speaking in general in order to create a competitive advantage for ourselves? Well, it would be niching it down to a tight focus where we have expertise and credibility and there's not as much competition. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um and I think that everybody listening on the call would be, you know, they'd be in the same uh, position, which is to gain a competitive advantage. Oftentimes you take a general topic and you make it more specific and you niche it down and you do that in a way. So now I think that if, you know, if we were talking about speaking expert, Abish, um, the, you know, really, maybe what our we're, what our competitive advantage is here, which we really haven't highlighted at all on the site, is learn, or maybe it would be the only speaking system. Let's put that in in quotes. That uses improvisational comedy or improv as its base. So now, naturally, we'd have to explain why that's important and valuable. And so, well, why, why would you say, Avish? Why, why, would, why would it be valuable? Let's say we niche it down a little bit and we concentrate on going after a certain particular group, but we also create this, it's the only speaking system that uses improv, improv comedy, as its base, what what would you say? Why is that valuable or important or necessary? Why would a speaker care about the fact that our system is the only one that uses improv as the base? Or why would somebody who is thinking of buying anything from us give a rat's behind about whether or not we're using improv comedy as our base? Why is that different from a lot of the stuff out there? Uh, well, I mean. From our perspective, it makes you more natural. It helps you uh, be funnier. Uh, frankly, it makes the material a little more engaging and entertaining. So when you get something, it's not going to be boring for you to go through. Yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I'm good yeah, with all... Helps you, what else? I was going to say, it'll help you um, do own your presentation doesn't go as planned, which is you know, a common... Common occurrence in the speaking world. Yep. And so I think that these are, you know, four really, really good points as to what makes ours different and unique. And I think we should sort of tend to highlight those because that's going to show people, as opposed to some stiff, you know, very stodgy approach to the speaking business, we're instead using this particular approach, which is, you know, much more effective and here's why. Mm -hmm. So I like I like doing that. So I think that maybe one of the things we can do is to sort of make sure and and find a way to put somewhere on the site, maybe up in this area here, right between speaking expert and the microphone, some kind of a box that says the only with only and bold and all caps, the only speaking system uh, to use improv comedy as its base. Learn why below. Learn why that's important or learn why that's so important. Learn why that's essential to your speaking success below. So I think that we may want to, you know, come up with something like that. Rather than, because when people come here, they've probably seen this kind of a pitch about speaking from a number of different sources. So right. let's try and make it, I mean, maybe we should make it a little bit more. I, I like that idea, so... What do you think? 
I mean, I like it in theory. It's kind of bringing us full circle to where we started a few years back, which I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, because we, you know, I think it's um, it's one of those things no one's looking for, but once they get here, it appeals to them. Yeah, I think that maybe that in terms sense. of in terms of how we get traffic here, we wouldn't be concentrating on improv comedy. We'd be concentrating on public speaking. But once they get here, in order to create a USP for ourselves or something that makes us stand out, I think that might be helpful. Mm-hmm. Certainly worth trying. Speaking of which, then what are our what are our numbers? Do you have any of those in terms of percentages? Percentage of people who visit who opt in. Uh, I can look that up, but um, I was working with Santa a little bit because the site was down. He had to someone was doing something on the site, so he had to like go in and fix some security holes. Yeah, there was some. But I'm getting a lot of like crap signups. So yeah. I'm not sure what that means for the numbers, but let me look. Yeah, I'm just Maybe curious, you know, how that uh, how it looks in terms of the uh, percentages, because obviously, few things will be affected by this, and one is, you know, and and and, and I have no problems with us if we want to do some testing to to test a video without my being even on there. I don't really care. We can, you know, I think maybe we should play with that a little bit. Right, well. so I can just put one up without. Uh... Yeah, and by the way, Avisha, well, let's see it, in the last. I was, I was going to tell you that um, I've gotten, and I think I told may have told this to you last time. Um, yeah, I did tell everybody here. Let me just give you uh, the, while you're looking, Carl. I think that's his name. No. Conversion rate experts. There it is. Okay, so this is, I'm going to talk with this guy next week, and we're going to do some stuff specifically on landing pages. And once that is done, I'm going to make that available on the main site on fredgleek.com, but, you know, it'll be great for, uh, for you as well as everybody who's on the call, on the webinar to go check that out as well. So that's something that you may cool. want to everybody may want to do um, so that's that's a that's a good thing so what would, were you were you checking on that Avish what'd you find out anything God yeah in the last month it's only uh, about three and a half percent okay so 3.5 percent opt-ins so we need to now how many total visitors was that based on Three hundred twenty-one unique visitors. Three twenty-one unique. So we literally only got like ten. Yeah, which is weird because I don't know how I was counting some of those crap ones. So I'm getting like four or five a day, but they seem to have like these garbage email addresses. Yeah, so um, but I mean, the the point is here we we've got to do something better, and maybe you know switch it up. Try. You know, test a new video. Put a new video on there. Do something crazy, shocking, whatever. Just let's let's try and mm -hmm. and just you know wear a gorilla suit. Do something. You know, let's okay. let's. I mean, it's when we have this kind of an opt-in rate. And by the way, so you might might be asking, like people are thinking, well, what's a good opt-in rate? And the answer is as high as possible. But at one point, Bill Deweese was getting, I think, like thirteen percent. You know, so obviously, if we can be north of 10% we're doing well in terms of mm -hmm. of of terms of percent percentage of folks who opt in that's our goal is north of 10% that would be what we're trying for so i'd encourage everyone to look at their numbers and by the way it you know it, it doesn't it's not a problem to just change things so in, in this here, we may put something else, the only system over here, and you may change the video and just do you talking directly to the camera rather than the two of us. I mean, let's let's try stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's, those numbers aren't, you know, they're, they're that, that's, those aren't good. So let's see if we can change it. Let's see. Um, the other thing is, what have you done um, since we last spoke? Any, any progress on the ClickBank stuff? Uh, no, you know, I was trying to make head or tails of the analytics, which are a little confusing. Um, I haven't done, I have made a lot of progress with that, other than just kind of... The ClickBank analytics? 
Yeah. Explain what you're talking about. When you're logging to ClickBank, you can go into reports, which it defaults to like your sales reports, but um, there's a thing called analytics, which lists how many visitors or whatnot you've gotten to your uh, sales page and whatnot. You know, how many, whatever, it, like I said, this is where it gets a little confusing. This is probably an addendum to that thing I did for you is, you know, they have like, say, oh, these are how many hops you got to your, and from all these different user accounts. I don't really know what that means. I've been trying to figure that out to see how we can use that. Yep, I agree. So put it down, and if you want to have a, the other thing we could do is we could have a, uh, a conversation, you, me, and, and Andrew, because he mm -hmm. recently sent me an email, said, hey, let's, you know, let's get going. And I was like, okay, but I still don't really know what to do, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's uh, let's let's get on the phone. Let's make a note to try and get on the phone with Andrew about that. Yeah. Super duper. Okay, so uh, let's see here. What what else am I uh, working on? That's uh, I. You know, I also found out, and I don't want to give any specific names on this, but I um, there are times when. You have to sort of just suck it up and realize that things don't always go right. Um, I've had a couple of incidents recently where I've actually gotten on a plane and not been able to meet with certain people who said they'd be available, and you know it wasn't really their fault, whatever. And and you can you know you can choose one of a couple different responses. I mean, you can choose to just be really annoyed and give the person a piece of your mind and and. Uh, really tell them how pissed off you are or you can just understand that hey same thing could have happened to you and the net result is when you do that uh two things happen to me no well first thing that happened to me is th really three so uh number one is uh i got a a great i'm sorry gift number two is they feel guilty and <laughs> owe you something and number three is, um, you know, number three is when they do put your project front and center, it will get done well. I mean, I, I this is like, you know, so I'm, uh, I used to be not as good as at this when I was younger because I was kind of like, I we used to used to just sort of yell and scream at people, and that it's not very effective as a strategy. I found. <laughs> um, so it's it's just a little bit better because the answer is, or the question is, do you want to do you want to just show people how right you are, or do you want to make money? And sometimes the answer, I mean, if your answer to that is make money, well then yelling is probably not a good way to go. You know, it just doesn't really work as an effective means of motivating most people. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, so that's that's something. Now, the other thing that we've got going on, and this is uh, something that you, you know, if you, I know you're you're sort of more uh, tied up now because of um, personal domestic situations, but I will make you the offer anyway. This, um, and I'll, you know what, I'll make this offer to anyone who's listening to this program. How's this? Because what we're going to be doing is over Columbus Day weekend here in Vegas, October 6th through the 8th, we are going to be create, we're, we're going, we're doing a dry run of the poker training with the guy that I'm JVing with on that. And so if anybody is going to be or wants to learn how to play poker, we got uh, a guy who's going to be training. Uh, actually, it's Bill DeWeese's wife and his daughter. And uh, they are going to be, while Bill and I are working on uh, putting together his book, which, by the way, that's another thing I should, let me just talk to you. Some of you listening to this know how important it is to have a book. Some of you have books, some of you don't. If you don't have a book, um, I'm on, I'm getting close to number 20 now, but I'm way, way behind Bob Bly, who's uh, up in the mid 80s in terms of total number of books Jeez. written. Yeah, I mean it's it's ridiculous. He should you know he should stop and let me catch up. Um, <laughs> he should write some for you. He should, he should really. Um, so, <laughs> but there's two things going on here. Number one is you know in order to dry test, dry you know 
do a dry run of the poker training. And all of us, no matter what field we're in, we can do this, is you assemble a bunch of people. The first time you do it, it's probably going to have some kinks and some problems. But if people aren't paying for it, you know, they can't really bitch too much. So get them to show up and do a dry run in front of your friends. Do it once, do it twice, do it three or four times. I don't know. Until you feel you're ready for prime time. And then you can either do it live and ask people to pay for it. Or you can then record it and create a product out of it. So that's what we're going to be doing in the poker arena. But I think it's a good idea. And, and, and you'll get a kick out of this. I've become, uh, I've, I've become, last time I was in New York, uh, I'm going to become sort of fairly, let me see here. Now, David all of a sudden has a question. Let me see this question. Um, let's see, I'll get to that, David. I'm not quite ready. I see you have a bunch of them there. Um, but one of the things that, one of the things that I have decided is I found a way to secretly, uh, sort of like, you know, remember that whole hubbub where the guy uh, recorded some some interview that he did with Planned Parenthood where he acted like he was this girl's pimp? Do you remember that, Avish? No, I don't. I don't oh, I don't yeah, it was so. a guy named James. Um, uh, let me, I can, I can Google it. But basically... This guy recorded an interview with Planned Parenthood. He was trying, he was like, he had a conservative agenda and he was trying to bust Planned Parenthood on the advice that they gave with regards to, you know, various things. So he went in there and he said, yeah, and he brought the girl in and he said, you know, I'm thinking of uh, allowing this woman to, uh, to prostitute herself and she's there nodding or something. I forget exactly how it went, but he basically did a hidden recording of the whole thing. So what I'm going to try and do is is do some recording um, of some you know especially things like and I don't again I'm gonna have to clear this with my lawyer so I don't know what's going on but there I, I think that the idea of doing some some recordings of whether it's poker or something else uh, would be pretty cool I've always thought that kind of uh, spy sleuthing kind of thing would be kind of neat to do um, mm -hmm. and so especially like in the poker environment. It would be great if you could actually see what cards were being dealt and, and how the game was played for real and stuff like that. I think that people would benefit a lot from that. Now, again, I have no idea whether or not I'm going to get this cleared um, because obviously every casino has their logos and their certain chips and they'd be able to identify whose casino you were in. And I don't know if that's you know technically or technically or actually legal. So that's something uh, that you, you want to make sure of before you do it. But I like the idea of doing, you know, people are always interested. Just like when I used to do customer service seminars, I would have loved to have had a recording device to give people examples of really great and really crappy service. Imagine being able to put up a video, pixelating the person's face mm -hmm. so that they wouldn't be exposed, and to show them either being a brilliant customer service person or just a complete jerk. Um, so that's one of the things, but doing a dry run. Um, so I'd encourage you all to, if you, if anybody wants to come out, you're welcome to let me know, uh, send me an email, fredgleek at gmail.com, G L E E C K at gmail.com. And we're going to be doing this as a dry run, uh, because eh, once you do it a couple times for free, then you can actually charge people for it and you can actually record the product. The nice thing is, and this is one of the things that I've always done, which is record everything you know, in terms of product-wise. Because you can always, even if you record, let's say that we did poker uh, training, you know, one, two, three, and then on the fourth go, we were going to record it. You could always take recording sessions one, two, and three and use them as bonus material for the one that you, that you claim is the real one, which is number four, and use these as, you know, bonuses and just give them to people for free warts and all so there is something that can mm -hmm. be said you know there's something that can be said for doing that now I, I had another brilliant point that I was going to make about this stuff but I've clearly forgotten it at this point um, any questions <laughs> on that Avish for me and on, then I'll go to uh, some advice. Well, it makes it makes a lot of sense and I'm wondering um, I mean I guess it would cost money but you could set up your own like little you'd have to get like a table and a, like, a professional dealer and pay them for the day but like if you want, if you couldn't get into a casino to record your own, yeah. Um, like you think there'd be that much value to it? Yeah. No. I mean, they're they're definitely um, 
that we're definitely going to do that because we actually have access to uh, one of the guys, the guy that I'm working with, my JV partner, who's not, I don't think he's on the call, uh, but, but the same guy who does uh, spasmodic dysphonia is also a partner in the poker, um, in the poker niche. And he is, uh, you know, the guy that he, uh, he works with has this incredible house setup of a poker table that's like really high end and it looks really, really good. So yeah, we could do that as well and that we were intending to. Um, but for, you know, for the purposes of, it always looks kind of cool. And, and David's question, by the way, let me answer this now because it's, it, it relates to what I, what I was trying to remember, which is Bill DeWeese is coming into town and he's like many people who are on the webinar or anyone else is the problem is they want to do a book, but they have no time. So here's what we're going to do with Bill DeWeese. Bill is going to come into town. We're going to have an outline, an extensive outline of his material, which is extensive outline. And it has his voiceover stuff. So we've already come up with, did you see, by the way, yet his, um, the logo, I mean, the cover for his book? No, I didn't see that. Uh, it's pretty cool. I, I should, you know what? I wish I could, I wonder if I can pull it up. You know what? I might be able to, but I'm not sure I can. Um, hmm. Uh, let me, let me try and figure it out. I don't think I have it on this computer. So what it is though, just to give you an idea of the image is it's of a, you know, like, you know how you see when a match strikes the, this, the, the, that sort of sandpaper kind of surface and it's igniting. And if you caught that just as it was catching fire, mm -hmm. yeah. picture that instead of a, a match, it was a microphone. Oh, nice. So, so my, this was my idea for an image. I'll take full credit whether it was or not, but um, <laughs> um, but I came up with this and I said to Bill, wouldn't that be cool? And and it's uh, how to start start and build a lucrative voiceover practice, parentheses, how to set your VO career on fire. Ooh. Yeah. So the idea, okay. yeah, you like that? I do. Yeah. So the, what would happen is, and so we we decided. I, I told, and this is, I, I think this holds true for everybody. Which is that if you want, so if you want to get a book done fast, here are a couple things. Number one, design and create your cover first. Because now that he has the cover, he says, man, that's going to look great when we have the book out. Well, yeah, well, now we need the guts of the book. Um, yeah. The next thing is, and this is what we're going to do, is we're not... I've decided that there are, you know, what I tried to do before, as you recall, is to record, record an interview and then have a, a writer or ghost writer uh, turn it into a book, what we call maybe narrative. And that didn't work at all. Uh, it, it just didn't work. So rather than doing that, uh, we're just going to go with the, we're gonna, just going to clean up and use the Q&A sort of as is, but edited. So we're going to have, the book is going to have every chapter. So first thing, the other thing I did is, a, another thing here is write intro and conclusion first. So after you design the cover, that would be step one. Then go down here and write your intro con and, and conclusion. So then what I said to Bill is, and this was his assignment, which is five is create an outline for the guts of the book. So now, so what he's done is he's written his intro and his conclusion. And then he's coming up with, I think it's like 16 chapters or 15 chapters, whatever it is. So you've got intro, 15 chapters and conclusion and then maybe a section for resources I'll review that resc so now you got your intro you got your conclusion you got your 15 chapters and in the 15 now this is going to actually be written the intro and the conclusion but the 15 chapters are merely going to be q a of me asking bill questions based on the outline that he gives me and puts together and enhanced to me when he gets here so we're going to record that. We're going to do some minor editing. And so the book, when you pick it up, is going to have question, question, Q, colon, 
me asking a question and Bill giving the answer. So this mm -hmm. book is going to be done within 30 days after Bill comes out here on October the 6th. I would think by uh, November the 15th, the book will be ready to go. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, and it's it's good because, you know, let me see if Dave had a, another question here. Does it have to be great? Trust me, mine aren't. Um, in terms of talking about the book, does it have to be great? Well, look at Avisha's too. I mean, you know, it's okay. It's, you know. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Both of our books are, you know. Well, the point is, you know, as we, we always say, which is done is better than perfect. So, uh, David, the question is, how much are people benefiting right now from your non-book? And the answer is not at all. So even if you come up with a book that might be, you know, try and make it at least a C level of book. Because the beauty of it is once, and it's the way we're doing publishing now, is once you create your, your average book, C, in terms of a letter grade, you can go back and redo it and tweak it. Maybe the next version is going to be a B minus, and then uh, the next version after that moves up to a B plus. Before long, you know, you get to an A minus or an A book after your fourth or fifth iteration. Who cares? Done is better than perfect. Get it out. Get it done. Get it finished, and uh, you know, make it happen after that. So that's what I would encourage you to do is to get it going. And this method of using the interview style, Q and A, edited is a great way to do it because when people see and you, you you put a big sort of box up on the first page before the book which says notice uh, this book was not done in the traditional format it was not written it is a recording of an interview done by the brilliant Bill DeWeese being interviewed by the less than famous Fred Gleek and uh, <laughs> so therefore it it's you, you just need to tell your potential readers how it's set up so that they aren't surprised or disappointed and I think if you do that you can get a book done really fast but I think that getting the cover done first and then recording the interview and doing a Q&A and having a Q&A interviewed is a really good way to go but again writing the intro and the conclusion first and getting your resources together people always like a section on resources like with Bill DeWeese it's perfect because he can put a whole section together on on home studio building a home studio would be a great little section there the the other thing there is there you know selecting a microphone uh you know another and, and he would have a whole checklist of things in the resource section so this is something that can be done and done well um and so you know let me just show you what we did avish in terms of trying to um we went to amazon and everybody this is sort of a good way to do this so if you're going to do a book on any topic so we went to books and we put in voiceover and so we looked at the very bo various books that were out there on voiceovers and you know we asked ourselves okay you know what what is this is ours better how can it be different um, you know there's just a lot of questions and things you can figure out you look at the reviews like this guy got 22 of them that's pretty good uh, this guy got 72 reviews and they're all five star that's pretty amazing there um, Tales and Techniques of a Voiceover Actor by Harlan Hogan. Um, no idea who he is. I'm sure Bill knows him. And so this is, you know, you can do your research by just going through and seeing what other people have done. And and I'd encourage you to buy it. This, this is pretty impressive. This guy has 72 reviews and a five-star rating. Let's just see what his... Golly. Now, you know what? Doesn't this... Avish, take a look. Can you see my screen? Yeah. What bothers you about these? About this? Well, yeah, the fact that there's that many reviews and they're almost, except for two, all five star and four star. Yeah, I'm suspicious that this is a setup. It is. Now, I'm not accusing him of doing anything wrong, but it does make it seem less real. Yeah, it, you know, and this is, it does. It Something doesn't seem right. So I'm actually encouraging you to, uh, to make sure that if you have, I mean, and I'm saying that if you have X number of positive reviews, that I don't think they should all be five stars. This looks this looks really fishy to me. Really does. No three star, no two star, no one star reviews out of seventy two reviews. I just think, I mean, God bless them. I think I hope it's a great book, but it just seems it would worry me 
Um, so the other thing is, this is interesting too. Um, this is this is a real name of this person, but it is not a bona, bona fide purchase. This one is a bona fide Amazon purchase. What's this? I'll show you what this is. This is an Amazon bona fide Amazon purchase. It means that the customer who wrote the review purchased the item is at Amazon.com. Customers can add this label to their review only if they verify the item being reviewed was purchased at Amazon.com. It sort of looks, it sort of looks uh, more legit. So if you scroll down through his five star star reviews, I think you will notice that some of them have real names, but very few of them actually purchased. Well, here's another one. I mean, so this guy must have a, may have a great book. And in a case like this, if we're doing our research, go ahead and get a couple of your competitors' books to see what they're doing so you can figure out what you want to do as well. Um, Avish, any uh, thoughts, ideas, questions, comments? Uh, no, it, uh, I mean, it all makes sense. I mean, I guess the one thing I was doing is you take your competitors' books or books on the same topic, almost go through it like you're doing a research paper. And I make notes of like things I agree with and things I disagree with because those disagreements are what's going to set your book apart. You know, as opposed to just being familiar with it, actually say, well, here's, this person says this, I think this is not quite right, or I think this is wrong, and, um, you know, make notes, and that can, because you want to be able to say, you know, why your book versus the other 20 that are out in the market on the same topic. I, I like that. Yeah, so I mean, you go through competition, take notes, say what you agree and disagree with. It'll help you to more easily put your own book together. Um, again, I think that doing the interview style can get a book out quickly, and provided that you let people know uh, what you know, what exactly the format of the book is, I think that the only time you get people really annoyed at you is if you misrepresent and say one thing, and it actually turns out to be something else. But if you tell people, and this is what we're going to do in Bill DeWeese's case is that I'm going to tell people, hey, you know, Bill is a working voiceover guy. He didn't have much time. He and I sat down over Columbus Day weekend, and we knocked this thing out, and it's going to be, you know, it's not going to be your typical typical looking book, but it'll have everything you need and more, and we intend to get uh, 75 positive reviews to knock uh, Harlan out of his spot. So, other thoughts, Vish? Anyway. Uh... Yeah. Okay, there. cool. Let's set up. Uh, David has been uh, hammering me with some questions, but I think I answered uh, most of them here. Anybody else have any questions? Let's. Uh, what about entries on one's blog? Uh, yeah, I blog entries might be a good. Uh, let me just see here. Uh, what about entries on one's blog? Does that mean that those questions can't be on off answered in the blog? No, it doesn't mean that at all, David. What it means is. You just have, you have to have some means, you know, of, uh, you could use your blog post, you can use anything. You just got to get, get your information out there. Even if you've done blog posts on the topic before, you can include those, you know. And uh, so, I mean, questions not answered, questions answered on the blog. Because remember that most people, even if they've re been reading your blog, would actually be delighted to buy and pay for uh, a place in which you had everything put together. So I don't have a problem with it. Again, telling people exactly what you've done so that you don't want to fool them and say, oh, this is completely new material. And the guy goes, dude, you know, three quarters of what you talked about, you'd already blogged about. I've been reading your blog for three years. And basically this book was uh, kind of ridiculous because it gave me exactly what I got reading your blog. You don't want to do that. So that's something. I like Avisha's idea of going through the competition's material, taking notes, and then highlighting what's new and different, unique about your approach. It's a good idea. Good, good, good idea. Okay, so anybody else? Anybody else have any other questions? Questions, anyone? Let me see. If you have a question, go down into the little go to meeting box there and put it in, and I will uh, be happy to uh, try and answer it. Um, this, is, this is your chance. I would say go for it if you have any questions. Um, Avish, let me just see here. Let's see. Um, what else? Oh, anything else we need to discuss? Somebody's just go. Mr. Dewey, speaking of which. He's just arrived. Oh. Watch what I do to him here. I always do this to him. William Wadsworth Dewey. 
<laughs> Speaking. Hi. Hey, how are you? We were just talking about you, and uh, yeah. I, I was talking. Well, my about ears were burning. Your ears were burning. Well, um, here's yeah. what we talked about. We talked about how to get a book done fast. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Yes. So you know what? By the way, do you have? I was telling people about it. And I couldn't get access to it quickly. Do you have the cover design available that you could? I could let. Uh, Share this. Let you well, have the screen for a second. Yeah, if you can give me a minute or two, I can dig through yeah, okay. my uh, email. I'm sure it's in there someplace. Uh, what was the name of the gentleman who sent it to us? I can't remember offhand, or I'm, uh, I'm, I'll need to do a search for it. You know what? I'm trying to remember again. What was it? Oh, it's the name of the company is Vectrix or something like that. Vectrix. Okay. Ve Ve Vector. Vectrix. Oh, it's Steve. Yeah. Vector. Vector. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'll, I'm looking okay, at what you know soon. So while you're doing that, here's what I did is I gave, talked about how you didn't have much time because you're a, you're actually a working voiceover artist as opposed to some who claim to be. And um, what I was saying is that to get your book done fast, you're coming out for Columbus Day weekend. And the thing we did was we designed your cover art first. Now you can tell people honestly and don't, you know, don't lie to me or to them. Was that not helpful in in helping you motivate it to want it motivate you to want to get it? Oh done? yeah, 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 yeah. Even more so than I thought it would. It's like once I saw it, I thought, "Whoa, that's cool." Yeah, well, that's that's a book I need to write. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I need to put some some meat between those pages, uh, between those cover pages. Uh, that's right. I found it by the way. I do have the cover. Oh, good. Okay, so I'm going to give you. I, I know this is dangerous to do to you, but I'm going to. I want to give you control of the screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me see. How do I do that here? Yeah, keyboard and mouse to okay are you ready and then give it a second I, I, I got to shrink it down into the proper size on my side because I'm recording this so I just turned over okay. I relinquished control I think do you have it yet I know right. is there something I'm supposed to do yeah I think that you should now be able to have control of that said that I, uh, I did it not Hold I on. still see your screen yeah, I see, uh, huh, that's weird. Let's see here. I, I, I went to the little panel, and I went to this. Give keyboard and mouse control to build the Wii's. Oh, there. Now you've got it, I think, Bill. Do I? Okay. You may. Yeah. Um, and it's, okay, let me know if it's too much. Not yet. I'm sorry? I'm still seeing Fred's. Yeah, I am too. Okay. So. It's it's it looks like there's a ghost image for me coming through, so it may happen shortly because I see a little, a little thingy. Yeah, you know what? I can't believe these. Yeah, I've got. It says that you have control, but I don't know. It does okay. But you know you what? See anything? No, you can't no. because it's it says you have control, but it's lying. Let me try. It, <laughs> let me try it this way. Hold on. Um, I don't want to mute you. Um, what? Avish, do you know how to do it? Why don't you try it from your side? You're a panelist. Try, try what from my side? Try and give control of the screen to uh, Bill Deweese. All right. Don't try this at home, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, do not try this at home. All right. Uh, Is it working for you? Because it didn't for me. You know what, Bill? Here's a better way to do it. Um, Can send it to you? Yeah, just send it to me. And I will uh, open it up. You know, just email it. That's a good me. idea. I wish I thought of that. I'm not seeing anything from my control panel. Yeah, hold on. Let me try it one more time. I don't understand why can't, you know, what's going on here? Oh, wait a second. Hold on. Let me try one more thing. Bill DeWeese, panelist. I've given control of the mouse and the screen, and it, it's just not working. <laughs> yeah, again, folks, don't try this at home. We are trained professionals. <laughs> I I just sent you the the email. Okay, let me try and see if I can find it then. Okay. Let's see here. Okie dokie, let's find it. Okay. Let's see here. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Come on. Load it, baby. Load it. Oh, here we go. Okay, so uh, there it is. Okay, let's view it. Nice. Can everybody see it? Yeah. Oh, I like it. Yeah. How to start and build a six-figure voiceover business. Set your VO career on fire. What do you think, Avish? 
I like it a lot. It's nice, huh? So yeah. after after Bill saw this, he became well. I'll let him speak for himself. You became a lot more uh, excited to finish it up, didn't you? Yeah, because there's something. Anytime you can visualize something, um, you know, it's always hard, and that's hard to do when it's not, you know, when it's not material in front of you. But once you see this, it's like that is the book that you know. All it's missing is for me to add the pages, you know, in between the cover. It looks so. It's very cool looking. So I'm very excited. Yeah, I am too. And uh, I mean, the other thing that we're talking to people about is, and this is, I don't know if you remember your marching orders, but before you get here, which by the way, you'll you'll have to be cramming if you haven't done this yet. You're supposed to come show up with your outline and your intro and your conclusion written. Remember that? No, I don't. <laughs> but I will. Uh, uh, but I remember an outline. It, it's trying, yeah, the outline. But if you can, you know, I know how busy you are, but you know, if you can. Write the intro and the conclusion, or at least outline the intro and the conclusion. But I think that that should uh -huh. be written, and then the other. And then what I said was, before the actual book starts on chapter one, we're going to have a page in there that says, uh, before you start reading, a big notice that says, this book is not your traditional kind of book. It is done in an interview format, so it's going to be much more conversational in tone. We're, we, 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 we sat down because Bill is such a busy voiceover artist, which is true. We didn't have the time. He didn't have the time to sit down and do his writing because he's busy actually working. So what we did is we recorded this interview. Blah blah blah. We're gonna have that up there in front of the first chapter to let people know. Oh, cool. I wondered how we were gonna do that. That's that's excellent. That's uh, that's good to know. Yeah, and I mean, if you think about it, I mean, I'm okay with that as long as everybody and in the description that we put up on Amazon and everything else. And by the way, we showed this to everyone else. Phil, you weren't on the call yet, on the webinar yet. Look at this. Tell me yeah. what what do you think of this guy's book? Um, he has seventy two reviews, seventy five star reviews, and two four star reviews. How does that make you feel about his about Harlan Hogan's book? Well, um, I'll say it for either... you. Does the does the term setup ring a bell? I mean, it sounds it just looks a little bit too good to be true, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I will tell you this. I know that he is highly respected. Uh, as a matter of fact, he's holding a free webinar tonight. Oh, is he? Um, he's, been, he's been doing this probably in the 60s. He's been doing this forever. Okay, so we don't want to uh, diss Harlan. But Harlan, if you're listening and if you ever hear this, what we would suggest is that even if you feel it's not the right thing to do, have a couple of people write a three and a two star review because it actually hmm. looks less credible to have 75 star reviews and two four-star reviews. I mean, to me it does. It looks like a setup. Yeah, it does look set up, yeah. And I mean, not, you know what? Maybe he's just a great guy and he's got great material, but, and even though that's the case, you still would want to try and, you know, let's not make it look like a setup because it kind of, it doesn't smell right right now. Do you agree? Yeah, I do. As a matter of fact, I'm sure that I read a review someplace of the book that wasn't nearly that comp it wasn't that complimentary. It said it was more it was less about really helpful information and more of a story of his life. Okay, so then again, I'm I'm sure he's got good stuff to tell, but you know, if you yeah. but but the other thing that I was doing here, uh, Bill, is I was showing people, you know, when we look through the all of the various books having to do with voiceover, you know, I gotta tell you that if you know your cover is going to look a heck of a lot better than any of these yeah i mean i, I really i mean this is a good one here there's money where your mouth is which by the way has got 25 reviews and the other thing if you'll notice is and, and this is one of the things that we're going to want to do now you see this one has a one star and three this is good 25 25 reviews 25 star three four star one three star and one one star i like this because then I would go to this one and I'd see it. But one of the things that is going to make your book different is look at the pub dates on these. This is 2011. That's relatively recent. But Harlan's book, this is 2007. That's starting to feel a little crusty. 2011, that's good. But one of the things you want to put in the immediate, so like let's say I click on Terry's book here and I go to it. One of the first things I want to put in this book description right here, Bill, is we're going to put... Yeah. If you want the latest, all caps bold, latest information on how to really make money in the voiceover business from a working voiceover artist who is doing work as you read this review, then blah, blah, blah. 
because you know, and yeah. then I would say, I would say, yeah. you know, there's a lot of information out there. Some of it I've read, most of it I've read myself when I was starting my voiceover career. However, a lot of that information is outdated. Mine is up to date, and I, I will keep updating this book, you know, on a regular basis. And we should probably update it every six to twelve months so that you're getting the latest and greatest information. Yeah, I like it. Good. Well. Thank you for. Uh, I, I, I'm glad you had time to show up, and uh, I. I, yeah, I think I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm late. No, 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 no. I, session, you you, you got to do what you got to do. Um, so I think that now is a good point to end. I want to thank everybody for being on the webinar. Bill, thank you for showing up, and Avish, thank you for being here the whole, whole time. I appreciate it. And uh, to everyone who's on, remember uh, we do these every week. And uh, please tell your friends, tell your family, come back next time, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you both for being here. Thank you all for being on the call. Take care, guys. Bye, guys. Bye. The organizer has ended the session, and this call will be disconnected.